Hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, a show serving the greater bleeding disorders community brought to you by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media and made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. I'm your patient advocate and host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your healthcare advocate, nonprofit nerd, and other host, Amy Board, reminding you, as always... You always do this. Please speak with a healthcare professional before making any treatment decisions. Don't take our word for it. No, do do not do that. (laughs) Do not do that for your own health's sake. On today's show, uh, I speak with patient and advocacy leader Brian O'Mahony about issues facing the community in Ireland and the world. And we hear updates from him on his experience as a person with hemophilia B who's been dosed with gene therapy. Yes. That is coming up today. Amy also speaks with Dr. Ben Samuelson Jones about the use of, of all things, Twitter. Twitter. And hemophilia. <laughs> Twitter, the social media site. And we are debuting the first installment of a brand new monthly segment, The Well, featuring Jessica Lauren Richmond of Bloodstream's Flow podcast, all that and more coming up on this episode. Welcome to Bloodstream. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening, as always. Honestly, thank you for listening. We do and appreciate remember, it. remember... It would be ridiculous to do this if they weren't. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, we were recording this at 3.39 p.m. on a Thursday. We're loopy. Loopy. This This is is the loopy show. This is going to be a great show. So if we're loopy, that means you have to subscribe. Please subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And episodes can be listened to and shared directly from our Facebook page, Bloodstream Media's Facebook page. And as always, if you've got suggestions for topics and guests, and if you have questions for Patrick or myself, ping us on social media or email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. And listeners, I want to remind you that the Bloodstream Podcast is made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Yes, that's right, Takeda. Takeda's got this website, you may have heard of it, bleedingdisorders.com, where you, dear listener, can learn all about Takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Get this. Takeda believes in a world free of bleeds. I'm for it, and are dedicated more than ever in their efforts to offer a wide range of programs and support to help patients throughout their treatment journey, wherever on that journey they may be. You can learn more by simply visiting bleedingdisorders.com. One more time for the folks in the back, that's bleedingdisorders.com. And for their founding and ongoing support of the Bloodstream Podcast, I would just like to say thanks, Takeda. Thanks, Takeda. Amy Board, neat guests. We're talking Twitter. We've got the well segment. Brian O'Mahony is going to say things in a brogue. Lots is going on. But first, <laughs> pal, how are you? Oh, my gosh. I am doing great. You know why? Anyone who lives with someone else can attest to how beautiful it is when you have a period of time where you don't have to live with someone else. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I like do. that alone time. And I have discovered, because I have lived by myself for a long time. I've been an independent lady. And now I don't. I live with somebody. Mm. And I I love living with someone. Usually. You, uh, like most the rest of us. Days, three fourths of the time. <laughs> but I didn't realize that the television, hmm. like the movies and TV that we watch, would be so skewed from what I would normally like the junk that I would oh, normally watch. Okay. And I just don't prioritize just watching my own thing forever. I read, that's what I prioritize doing. So Ew. when I'm alone, <laughs> 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 so when I'm alone, the stuff that I watch is usually ridiculous. But this time, I had four days alone, and I decided to, like, go full-blown, like, lady drama movie. Nice. So okay. I watched, like, all of the leading, the Best Actress uh, nominees from the Academy Awards, like, all of their movies, and, like, full-blown lady dramas. Oh, okay. Did you agree with this year's awardee? No, I love her. Jessica Chastain won for Tammy Faye, and I love Jessica Chastain, and I am supportive of her, but I liked other performances better, which is fine. You what know. was your favorite of the year? My favorite was Olivia Coleman in The Lost Daughter, and Olivia Coleman's won every— I get that, like, she, but f- for my money, I mean, that movie, that movie is so good— it reminded me of like the '90s. Remember when the '90s, mm. like, and I grew up in the '90s. Sure, yeah, I same. Came of age in the '90s, <laughs> and I thought that's just how movies are supposed to be, uh, and it's not. We don't have movies like that anymore. But mm. that movie made me. It reminded me of it. it was so good. Nice. So anyway, I've had 
I've just been doing lady dramas. Just been doing lady dramas. But now he's back. He's back. He just I, got back. I won't be watching lady dramas tonight. What are you going to have to watch We're now? Probably going to have to watch people doing chores in Alaska, which mm, is fine. Yeah. A lot of outdoor chores. A lot of outdoor chores. Yeah. Which I I actually enjoy. It's like a nice, you know, like relaxation sure. thing. But... How to do your errands while looking at your own breath and <laughs> carrying an axe. It's really, I can understand why people would enjoy that. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> I love those shows, you guys. I, I'm glad somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not keeping the ratings afloat. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, PJL. You yeah. have like community news and stuff. Like what's going I do. on? What's Who going knows? On? Who knows really? No, but there are a few things that I thought might be worth uh mentioning. So I got three three quick hitters. I was I was wondering three is there a little baby quick yeah, hitters? I guess I just answered my own question. Am I gonna title this little section anything? I guess it's called three quick hitters. So <laughs> Yeah, three headlines I wanted to read and maybe chat with you just about a little bit. The first was, uh, did you know foam rollers are good for you? So they did a study out of Spain with 25 hemophilia patients, A and B. And bottom line is that they learned through this study, and I don't have it open in front of me now, but it was like every day for X amount of minutes per day for— eight weeks, they did these exercises with foam rolling. No one had any bleeds or adverse events. I wouldn't imagine one would, but you never know. And the bottom line was that people improved their flexibility, range of motion, and reduced pain intensity, which I guess I would have figured. But it's also just nice to know that, okay, they actually took the time out of Spain here with patients to do the work of of a legit study. This is a published thing in real journals to you know, prove that a foam roller, a pretty simple and expensive and not particularly cumbersome piece of equipment could make a meaningful difference in your joint health and experience with pain. So, Have you ever used a foam roller? I have. I I feel better when I do. I know. I don't use it as much as I definitely should, given how simple it is to use. I know. I know. But, but, but... I love this. I'm not going to lie. I really love that just to even put it in your brain, those of you that experience, you know, mobility and chronic pain, that's, that's, you should try that out. And you know what? I have a foam roller still that I got as a gift from somebody like 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, actually, our friend Delisa, who <gasps> does stuff with us on certain projects here, love has her. been on this podcast before, but she got me a foam roller. And I got to say— what a great gift idea. Yeah. <laughs> because it's cheap. <laughs> now, now, look, I, I, maybe you want to get somebody, you know, a DVDs of Chores Outside Season 8. I don't know. Everybody's <laughs> different. What A gift is something different to, depending on who the receiver is. But <laughs> made me laugh. if you know a hemo in your life <laughs> and you want to help their health Y'all, out. seriously, give each other foam rollers? <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> Listen. April, what's coming up? What's, <laughs> Memorial Day is coming up, and I know you're all looking for that perfect hey, Memorial Day hey, non-barbecue we're gift. We're a couple weeks out from HFA. We're all going to see each other one more time. If I don't see a bunch of foam rollers walking around, y'all gifting each other foam rollers, I'm going to think less of y'all. Can we get a sponsor from the foam roller industry. Actually. We will talk about foam rollers on every episode. Industry people that are listening to this, I hope we don't have to cut this out. Y'all should have foam rollers at your booth. Oh, that's a great idea. Mm. Well, if you're listening to this, that's what we think you should do. Visit Takeda at (laughs) bleedingdisorders.com. Also, Takeda, get some foam rollers. We'll talk about them. So there's foam rollers. You should roll around on the Mm. foam. It's good for the body. Here's another thing. Um, This is the second headline. Uh, Foods to avoid with hemophilia. This one, I don't know. What? I was like, this, I've been looking for this article for about 36 years. Oh, my God. If you have hemophilia, you don't need another thing. Uh. Uh, But here's what it it turns out. You know what they don't think you should have? Sugary foods. Sugary foods. No good. With hemophilia, that is. That's stupid. No one should have sugary foods. <laughs> I know. And this is basically saying that. And then it's like, well, and especially if you have hemophilia. So that's a little bit cheap. Um, <laughs> turns out there's certain supplements, too, to maybe be kind of, I don't know, mindful of. Vitamin oh. E supplements have been known to increase the risk of bleeding, which is why doctors ask surgery patients to stop taking vitamin E several weeks before a procedure. Did not know that. Don't know if this is going to change anything in my life. But, all right, now I'm aware. Vitamin E do a little more research before ever having it. And again, 
isn't this everybody? High fat foods. Yes, any healthy diet should include some sort of fat, but a lifestyle full of high fats can have negative consequences on your weight. Since the body stores fat easier than carbohydrates, weight, of course, just makes hemophilia symptoms worse, more pressure on the joints, et cetera, et cetera. Um, foods rich in iron. That's a good thing. Yeah, we yeah. like those. Have that. Foods rich in calcium. Positive on that. Also mm. good. Hey, you know what else people with hemophilia should do? Mm. Stay hydrated. Oh. That's on this list. Mm. But also a reminder to all of us that literally probably all of us could <laughs> use to drink more water. Yeah. You know, if you're listening to this, just take a swig of water right now. I had a moment actually with Natalie. It wasn't too long ago at home. <laughs> and I was I was filling up a glass of water for myself. And I had this moment of like, wait a minute, do I have a glass maybe upstairs? And I just had this real internal moment of panic. Like there might be an active full glass of water here in the house already waiting for me. Maybe I shouldn't pour this one. And then I stopped and I thought, you know what I've never heard anyone say to me? Hey, Patrick, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> Your health seems generally put together. You're thriving, mostly. If you could just slow down your water intake, <laughs> you're drinking way too much water. I don't know if you're ever pouring two glasses when you should only have one. We got to slow you down on the water. So I went ahead. I poured the water. I had both glasses of water. That was weeks ago, but I think I'm still riding high from that. I haven't had water since. Anyway, stay hydrated, folks. <laughs> Whole grains are good and cook with healthy fats. So there's some interesting information about dietary stuff. But I will say that sugar thing, like, again, that's just true for everybody. I do believe that my being more mindful about my sugar consumption in 2022 than I was for the last four months of 2021 mm. has had a meaningful impact on my joint pain. No, I, and yeah. I think it has to do with inflammation yeah. and resulting pain, which leads me to article number three. Oh? Amy, I don't know how to even really talk about this. I saw this headline and was like, I think this is about to connect and blow my mind at the same time. <laughs> Ankle joint damage and hemophilia, common but not linked to pain. What? So this was the title of an article published in Hemophilia News Today by Lindsay Shapiro at the end mm. of last month, March. And it's based on a study that was done. The study published in the journal Hemophilia is titled Gaining More Insight into Ankle Pain in Hemophilia A, a study exploring pain, structural, and functional evaluation of the ankle joint. And here's what the beginning of the article states. Structural joint damage and significant pain are evident in the ankles of people with hemophilia, as we would expect. <laughs> but the two were not found to be related to one another in this recent study. Huh. Researchers suspect that ankle pain may originate in the somat— and uh, bear with me, everybody— somatosensory nervous system. I am not a nervous system expert. Somatosensory nervous system, which relays nerve signals from the body to the brain via the spinal cord rather than with the ankle itself, so that the ankle pain may originate in the nervous system rather than with the ankle itself. A quote from the article, quote, structural joint damage is, is present in many ankles, but is not related to pain in people with hemophilia. Further studies should consider somatosensory nervous system dysfunction in patients as, contributing, as a contributing factor to painful ankle joint disease. The article goes on and talks about these two different parts of the nervous system. Um, it could it could have a little more to do with neuropathic pain uh, as opposed to noisyplasticity. I'm so outside my comfort zone right now mm -hmm. talking about this, but the reason, Amy, that this like kind of did a thing to me mm -hmm. is this has been my one of the things I have experienced from a very young age are doctors looking at my x-rays of my ankle and being like, whoa, that is bad. That's how are you? And I'd be like, I'm okay. Now, yes, I live in with chronic pain. We have talked about this. We've talked about the cortisone shot. We've talked about my considering surgery. It is still not scheduled. The cortisone shot is still doing me well. I am still on that trajectory. But I've always had this underlying sense that what they are physically seeing and looking at and responding to mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of like my pain tolerance or mm -hmm. yes, pain is personal. I've always just had this sense that like there's something else. I'm just not experiencing a certain amount of pain that you all seem to think I ought to be based on what you structurally see. Hmm. So this article talking about the nervous system, and mm -hmm. I've also experienced different kinds of like neuromuscular twitching mm -hmm. and other things that have been like 
okay, now I'm having pain and discomfort, but it feels like it's related to my nervous system and twitches in my head mm. more than like my hip or my knee or my ankle where it may be like materializing as a as a twitch or as a restless leg or something. So when I saw that headline and saw some of the statistics, I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher them if I jump in, but it just seemed as though, oh, I'm not alone. Like this mm. is a thing where people with hemophilia show this kind of damage to ankles, but don't necessarily experience pain that correlates to the structural damage Maybe that pain isn't centered in the structure hmm. of the joint. Maybe that pain is centered in the nervous system. Interesting. Why just ankles? Why not knees or like elbows? I don't know. That's huh. a great question. And I don't know. And maybe maybe this article or the greater study gets into that. Yeah. So this is something now I'm going to try to pursue a little bit because I want I want to understand this better. But yeah. I was just so— that's why I said it resonated and at the same time was like, whoa, I don't know how to process that. But Where would you find that article again? Hemophilia News Today. It was published on March 25th. The author is Lindsay Shapiro. She's a PhD, S-H-A-P-I-R-O. And the title, one more time, Ankle Joint Damage in Hemophilia Common but Not Linked to Pain. So I'd highly recommend if that's something that correlates with you or your child or your spouse's yeah. experience with hemophilia— Check it out, and let's try to better understand this because I think there's areas of pain and, yeah. and hemophilic joint damage that, to me, this suggests we've only just begun to really uncover. Yeah. yeah. Uh, everybody, check it out. That link will be in the program notes. I got one last thing. Even though those are my three things, we talked about food, we talked about the ankle joint pain damage, foam rollers for life. Foam but I've rollers. got a fourth topic. I'm going to sneak it in. It's a little bit more personal. Uh, Michelle Kim who has been the executive director of the Hemophilia Foundation of Southern California for most of my nine years out here. I remember when she first started quite well. Um, well, she announced her stepping down as the ED just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was an email and posts that came from the foundation that have a statement from Michelle. I'll read a portion of that here. Quote, after eight years of service to the Hemophilia Foundation of Southern California, I will be resigning as executive director. Many of you know that in addition to a son with hemophilia, I also have a daughter with multiple rare conditions. Balancing my work with these responsibilities has been challenging, but I have served with exuberance, dedication, and passion developed from this personal experience of advocating for and overcoming many challenges faced by people with rare disease. Mm. My daughter's current condition requires that I devote more time to her care. I cannot give to this job the same level of dedication, and therefore it is with great sadness that I submit my resignation. It has been an extraordinary honor to serve this vibrant and resilient community. Michelle's use of exuberance, dedication, and passion could not be more apt for yes. what she has brought to this role and what she has not only uh, given to the community here in Southern California, but what she has given to our community around the country and around the world. Yeah. She and the Southern California chapter have been recognized and honored and awarded for multiple reasons, rightfully so, over the last number of years because of their extraordinary work. And I will not mince words. It begins and ends with Michelle. Before Michelle started, those kind of awards and recognitions and honors were not happening. It's because the leadership that was there. Now, Michelle has established a foundation that is operating with integrity, with exuberance, dedication, and passion. It shows in the work, it shows in the community, and it's a tremendous loss to lose her from this leadership seat. Of course, the reason could not be more understandable um, in fact, as I said to Michelle when she mentioned this to me, I'm bummed from a community standpoint, and I imagine most will be, but I couldn't be more proud of you for doing what's right by, so clearly right, by you and your family. And at the same time, I'm sorry that those are the circumstances that are yeah. forcing this decision. So yeah. just want to give Michelle all the the love and, and, and tribute that she deserves. Yeah. You know, I think nonprofit organizations, um, really thrive, I think, on um, continued, you know, energy being put into the the mission. And I think as heartbreaking as it is, community that might be listening to lose her, I really think it's a it's an opportunity for the chapter and the organization to take the foundation that she's created and really, you know, bring new ideas, bring new, you know, energy towards it. And, you know, I, I I think that's such a beautiful thing 
specifically about nonprofits. You know, it's just lovely to have so many people have their hands on the work. And being an executive director of um, a smaller nonprofit, but, you know, Michelle has really grown that organization to something of substance. And um, it's just not an easy job. And I just, my, I have the deepest respect for her. And um, I really think it's it was the right time for her to step away and really focus on her family. And I um, support and love her um, just as a human. So hats off to you, Michelle. And uh community. I, I, I think this is this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, also a wonderful opportunity for you to get involved, make sure your voice is heard um, in the organization, uh, make sure you show up to those meetings and communicate and engage with those board members that are going to be a part of the next iteration of your chapter. It's really exciting. Yeah. And if you are, you know, not in Southern California, um, you know, your executive director may not be on, on the way out, but it might not be a bad idea to take this moment to Consider, are there opportunities in your local organization to throw your hat in the ring for a committee seat for something, for a board seat that's opening up, for some kind of leadership volunteer role for an upcoming meeting, something that helps, to Amy's point, your voice get in the mix. So especially as changes come, as they do for every organization at certain points, you're just that much more embedded and in, in a position to perhaps be part of the next wave of leaders in, in your local organization. So, mm-hmm. Michelle, we support you. We'll be following you. And we love you. And we'll now go from one leader, talking about one leader anyway, to talking to another advocacy leader, Brian O'Mahony, the CEO of the Irish Hemophilia Society, former president of the World Federation and the European Hemophilia Consortium. He's a fancy guy. He's had a lot of big posts. He'll love that I just said that. He has also been dosed with gene therapy as part of a clinical trial investigating the use of an AAV gene therapy for hemophilia B. Brian joined us I don't know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, shortly after he first started um, talking about that to share with us his experience thus far. He gives us updates on how that's going, as well as what's happening with community in Ireland and what he's gleaning from advocacy and scientific meetings around the globe. The guy's going to meetings all the time, virtually or in person or otherwise. Um, If there are meetings happening on other planets, Brian is probably there in one way or another. But right now, he's here with us on Bloodstream right now. Okay, joining me now, you've heard him before and you'll probably hear him again. He's Brian O'Mahony. Brian, thank you. Welcome back to Bloodstream. Thank you, Patrick. So I think the last time we spoke wasn't too long after you had posted about your decision to get dosed with gene therapy for hemophilia B as part of a clinical trial. I want to ask you about things in Ireland. I want to ask you about what you're learning from the the meetings you're attending, the global scientific meetings. But first, just on a personal level, how are you and has your point of view or your feelings about your choice to undergo a dose of gene therapy as part of this clinical trial shifted at all since we last spoke to you? The short answer is I'm great and my decision hasn't altered. My, My perspective hasn't altered. Doing really well, still walking away. Obviously, like everybody else, we're a mixture of hybrid and in the office and starting to travel again and move around. It's now two years, just over two years since I was dosed with the gene therapy vector. I've done really well. I've been fortunate. I've had no real side effects or adverse events. And my, my factor expression has remained relatively stable. Fantastic. And no, no breakthrough bleeds? No, no. I, I've, I've, I've required no factor for prophylaxis in the last two years. No factor for bleeds. The only factor I've required has been for a biopsy or or for a steroid injection into my back where they want to bump me up to 100%. But apart from that, uh, no bleeds. And I guess when you look at this, you know, my ABR before gene therapy was already very low because I was on prophylaxis with an extended half-life factor 9. So, you know, there there isn't a big change in ABR. Having said that, I don't have to take prophylaxis every week or every 10 days. And I think the big difference is that, you know, I, I'm a clumsy devil at times and, and uh, <laughs> I, I had a couple of traumas, which in the past would 100% have required treatment. Uh, and mm. with the gene therapy, they didn't require treatment. That's neat. What about travel? We were talking off mic just before we started here, how you were recently in Lisbon, which 
Actually, my, my wife and I were married in Portugal, so I have quite a fondness for Portugal. But so we're traveling again. The pandemic restrictions have, are lifting. Are you thinking any differently about your travel schedule now that you are that you well, are producing your own factor? Yeah, it's easier. I, I don't have to pack a lot of factor with me. You know, in, in the past, you know, I, I traveled an enormous amount pre-COVID. I think 44 trips abroad in 2019. Half my hand luggage is all, always taken up with factor and the, the very accessories you need. That's no longer the case. If I'm going on a long, long trip, I may still put in a factor for one infusion just in case if it's a relatively long trip. Otherwise, no. Sure. I've traveled a few times since last November. And, and actually, on one or two occasions, I didn't bring factor simply because it never entered my head. It's kind of that focus to always think of factor first when I'm, fact, when I'm packing is gone. Isn't that amazing? It didn't even enter your head on a couple of occasions. To think about, like, that is unthinkable to me, yes. in my own experience anyway, and I'm sure to you just a few years ago. But now the reality is that that can actually happen. That's, that, gives me, that gives me chills a little bit. So that's very cool. I'm excited for you. I'm glad to hear that it's continued to be something that you're uh, very positive on. In the past, when I was traveling, I'd make sure I had my passport with me and my factor. Now I just have to remember the passport. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. It was always, okay, if I have to check this bag last minute, for example, the one thing I need to be able to account for is my factor. It was a, it was the priority item in packing. So it's yep. night and day. That's very neat. So let's talk a little bit about hemophilia in your home country of Ireland. We're talk, talking to you right now from Dublin. What is the state of hemophilia and bleeding disorders care in the community in Ireland right now? Are patient advocacy meetings happening again? Are people coming out to them? How are you going between hybrid and live and virtual? Are there any particular concerns amongst clinicians that are top of mind? Well, just give us a, the lay of the land in Ireland at the moment. Okay, I, I think when we last spoke, Patrick, we, we had transitioned to a lot of webinars, a lot of Zoom meetings and events for That's our correct. members. I think we did 50 or 60 last year. Now, in October of last year, we had our first small in-person event. People were very cautious. It was adults only. They were all vaccinated. And then uh, last month, or actually this month, the first weekend in March, we had our annual conference. So we had 170 people there, including adults, children, babies, teenagers, volunteers. Uh, it was fantastic, really fantastic to see everybody in person. But even though the government requirements uh, have, you know, immeasurably eased here, we still maintained the situation where anybody attending, any adult attending, had to send us proof of double vaccination and their EU vaccination cert before they registered or when they were registered and they couldn't attend if they weren't vaccinated. We had a mask mandate uh, at the meeting. So, you know, we wanted people to be safe because even though the worst of COVID at the time appeared to be over, you know, we're, we're conscious of the fact that we have a relatively vulnerable cohort in our population, people with immune deficiency, with HIV, mm -hmm. some members with asthma or COPD. So we wanted people to feel safe. So I, th I think that went really, really well. Prior to that, I was starting to see a little bit of Zoom fatigue, where the, sure. the attendance at some of our Zoom meetings was tailing off. As life was getting back to normal here in Morn Ireland, people were going out more. They weren't attending Zoom meetings as much. So I think we, we now have a program of four or five in-person meetings this year that we will do, small and big meetings. We will maintain webinars, but probably about one a month, no more than that. Maybe even one every six weeks. We need really good topics. We'll be cautious, we'll be conscious of the fact that the situation is still evolving and may change again as we come toward the winter. But I think certainly things are opening up again. People are feeling more optimistic. It was really nice for members to meet each other again. But I think the, the pandemic has also taught us that you can impart information very well using webinars, using podcasts, using social media. Uh, it doesn't always have to be big in-person events. And crucially, I think one of the key elements we've learned is that even if somebody can't make a webinar at seven o'clock on a Tuesday evening, then and they may not need that information at that point in time. If we put the webinars on the website afterwards, they can access it when they actually need it. And that's really useful. Right. So, we, so we've been banking a lot of, of useful information on our website. And what about on the clinical side? Is there anything that clinicians are talking about maybe a little bit more these last few months that's particularly top of mind for them, whether it's related to you know, COVID and where we stand or not? What's going on with the clinicians within Ireland? Well, I, I think, interestingly, I'm, I'm just finishing a survey, actually, for a talk I'm doing at WFH, where I, I, I've surveyed a lot of hemophilia societies and a lot of clinicians about COVID and what's changed in their practice and what will change in the future. I think people are thinking seriously about this. They're obviously, the hospitals and institutions are dealing with COVID. A lot of them have been down staff because some of the staff have been out sick with COVID. Some oh, sure. of the hemophilia infrastructure has been temporarily taken over 
So we'll be working hard to make sure we get that back when the worst of the COVID pandemic is over. I think elements like telemedicine will become ingrained as part of the clinical practice. They've seen the advantages of, you know, not asking people to travel 200 miles for a 15-minute consultation when they can do it over Zoom. And I think realistically, do you need the person to be there physically? Perhaps if you're taking bloods, yes. But actually, lovely example, Professor Mike Macquist in Sheffield, his hospital have a drive through phlebotomy service where you, you book mm. your bloods beforehand, you drive up to this tent, you stick your arm out the window, they take the bloods, having checked your barcode, and off you go. You never even get out of your car. Now, that was wow. done primarily for the pandemic. That will be maintained in the future. Mm, that's smart. That's a great example of something that the pandemic taught us that doesn't yeah. need to end just because the pandemic has, if not come to an end, greatly reduced. I've yet to be so careful. I think, by the way, the, the other thing we've done here since the pandemic started in the last year is we, we have online physio exercise classes for people with hemophilia and bleeding disorders every week, and they're going really well. Fantastic. You mentioned that you were preparing this survey for the WFH, the World Congress yeah. coming up in May here shortly. You are someone, I feel like anytime there's a scientific meeting, a global scientific meeting, I can be rest assured that not only is Brian there, he's tweeting about it, he's pushing out some valuable takeaways. So I'm curious to ask you, as someone who does go to a lot of these meetings, what data or information or trends are standing out or are top of mind for you right now? Well, I, I, I guess the, the big one is gene therapy and the fact that gene therapy looks like it's going to be licensed in the next year. And how is that going to be integrated into our decision systems, into our clinical systems, into our patient education systems, and economically, how, how our country is going to pay for this? It, it's going to mean new thinking in the same way that COVID-19 has meant the clinicians have to rethink the way they do outpatient clinics and appointments. I think gene therapy is going to force upon us a change in thinking about you know, how you pay for this, how you look at this, how you assess this economically. Because for the first time ever, you may be looking at, for example, a, a, an annual payment model for a one-off treatment. And many countries don't have the mechanism to do that. So I think mm. economics uh, um, uh, is, is something we're, we're very much looking at at the moment. I think obviously we're keeping an eye on the safety and efficacy of the gene therapies as they're developing the trials and the you know, there, there are all the uncertainties around duration of response, uh, variability of expression, predictability of expression, long and short-term safety, but also economics. In a sense, I think countries have to be concerned about the fact that it may well be the case that in some countries, the decision about access to gene therapy will be taken by some body outside of hemophilia care, and the decision will be handed down like tablets of stone to Moses from high up on the mountain. And people won't have any input into that. And that's, I think, mm-hmm. something we want to avoid. So to me, that means that the patient organizations and clinicians must be involved in the decision-making process. I saw that you were an author on a few different things that were recently published. I'm going to name them. And then if you can just give us maybe a couple of highlights from those sure. respective pieces. So one of them was titled, Preparing for Tomorrow, Defining a Future Agenda. What's that all about? Well, there's a supplement in hemophilia. There are a couple of papers. One is looking at health technology assessments and how they might need to adapt or or alter the way they do things for gene therapy. There's a paper on a value framework, which I worked on with Mark Skinner, who will be well known to to your listeners. Um, And that was really looking at all the evidence that's out there, comparing the different types of therapy from standard to extended half-life to emicizumab to gene therapy, Look at the evidence that's there that discriminates between these therapies. But also, it's a good way of pointing out where their gaps are in the evidence. So you'll see a lot of gaps in this, Mm. which means that that's where the companies really need to start looking at producing data. And then there was a very good paper on alternative payment methods, which looks specifically at gene therapy and defines, I think, 14 different potential payment models, some of which are finance-based, some of which are outcome-based. And the Preparing Future Agenda paper really tried to bring all of those together and look at how we, how we use this information, how we integrate this into our thinking and decision making. So, for example, if I take the alternative uh, payment models model paper, there are basically four broad, broadly speaking, four types of healthcare systems for payment. There are 14 different payment models. There are 18 factors which impact each of those payment models in each system. That gives you 1,002 variables. Wow. So we need to start charting all of those. Now, if you, look, if you look at that paper, if you look at that alternative payment model paper, you'll start to see straight away, whatever country you're in, okay, this one doesn't work here. This one clearly won't work. But there'll be several which will work. And then you look at the factors mm-hmm. which impact on that. And then you, you start to narrow it down. So really, 
it's it's almost like a, a broad a la carte menu that you look at and see what's what what will work, what won't work. And I certainly think as we as we project the need to have the hemophilia patient organizations and clinicians formally involved in the decision making process and not just leaving this to the governments, the payers and the health economists, then the the more modeling we do, the more knowledge we have in this area, the stronger position we'll be in. Okay, so if if you can go in and say, I think I think the best model for our country is A and B, A or B, and they, they come back and say, well, what about C? Ideally, you will have looked at A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and K beforehand and be able to just talk about knowledgeably about which of those will work and won't work. So it's really a question of doing your homework. And is that what these papers are essentially intended to help advocates make the argument for what system, what model will work best in their home countries? Is that what you're hoping you and your co-authors when you put these kinds of pieces together? Yes, broadly speaking, yes. And certainly the value framework is a framework that originally developed by Porter and Harvard. We published a hemophilia version a couple of years ago, and then we followed up with a paper looking at a value framework comparing standard prophylaxis on demand, standard NHL. This one goes into standard EHL, subcutaneous therapies, and gene therapy. So really, you're looking at frameworks for evidence. You're looking at uh, different alternative payment models. When, when, um, when, when you talk to the HG agencies and ICER in the States last year, when, who did a very good process where they looked at factor versus semicizumab versus gene therapy, they keep asking for you know, evidence. This must be evidence-based. This must be, this must be methodical. And that's really what this is aiming to do, to help in that process. Now, you were also one of the authors on the piece published with Biomarin's Phase 3 data, long, yeah. long-awaited data. What was most striking to you from that data? Well, I think, first of all, we have to celebrate the fact that, you know, a, a significant proportion of people with factor eight deficiency who were on the clinical trial got very good factor expression that's been maintained over a couple of years. Now, clearly, mm-hmm. it's, it's still early days. There is, there is a lot of variability. There, there is lack of predictability. And we're not sure how long the, what the duration of response will be. But compared to where we were four or five years ago, and sometimes we forget this because we do tend to focus very much on the negative. We do tend to focus very much on the unanswered questions. But it's probably mm. worth stepping back for a moment and celebrating just how far we've come. You know, because I've been around this community for a long time. And, you know, like gene therapy was always five or 10 years away. Never seemed to get any closer. And now right. we're on the cusp <laughs> of it being licensed. So I, I think I think it's 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 reassuring. There's good data there. I think there are still a lot of imponderables and unknowns. And I think, but it does point to the importance, the real importance, of continuing to collect data on every person, ideally with hemophilia who has gene therapy into the future. And that's why I think the World Federation of Hemophilia Gene Therapy Registry will be a really important tool. Because if you're looking at something like gene therapy, which is relatively rare in terms of the number of people who've been treated. And you're looking for uh, safety and efficacy data. You, you know, if you're looking for rare adverse events, you won't find those unless you have an entire global population. Otherwise, right. it, it'd, be a bit, it'd be a bit like looking for you know, an adverse event linked to a specific factor concentrate in the USA just by looking at the patients treated in Idaho. You, know, it's, it's, you need that broader global group of people just to give you sufficient numbers to really start seeing patterns. And listeners who have also listened to our podcast, The Global Hemophilia Report, on our second episode that came out just this month in March, we talked with Mike Recht at Athen, as well as Glenn Pierce from the WFH, who spoke about this registry that Brian's referring to right now and how the two organizations were harmonizing their efforts so that Athen could take responsibility for data collection within the U.S. and the WFH could focus outside the U.S., but making sure, and I liked the use of the word, that the questions were harmonized so that there would be comparable data across all collection. And Brian here speaking to exactly why we need to continue doing that. It's funny when you mentioned though the, the five to 10 years thing, I can't help but laugh. And listeners have heard me mention this before, but I remember in the early 90s, my great uncle handing me a, a newspaper clipping with the headline, hemophilia to be cured by gene therapy by 1999. And I remember as, you know, as it got to be 1994, 1995 and 1996, thinking, all right, we're getting closer and closer, not hearing much about it. We'll bring it up in the clinic not hearing much about it. It just always seemed like it was in the future, a little bit way, not too far, but a little ways away. And now here we are. We have phase three trial data. I'm speaking to somebody who has had gene therapy. He he was dosed two years ago and its impact is doing great for him. So we're we're living in that reality. I appreciate you pausing us to take a step back and appreciate truly we are in a, a phenomenal moment in time in hemophilia treatment history. 
Yep. So I mentioned w- one last thing I want to ask you about, Brian. I mentioned just now the Global Hemophilia Report, and I'm currently working on a couple of episodes there where we're looking at prophylaxis as well as bone and joint health. And listening to various researchers and hematologists talk about prophylaxis, bone and joint health, but then in particular emphasizing the need to better understand mild and moderate hemophilia experience and how perhaps we could be thinking a little differently about prophylaxis, especially for moderate patients. Data that's suggesting that even when bleeds aren't reported by mild and moderate patients, that upon x-rays and MRIs, we can see evidence of joint deterioration as a result of hemophilic bleeding. So there, there, there is something there that we haven't quite pinpointed. So I'm curious from your perspective, again, as somebody who attends so many scientific meetings and who's very involved in your home country as well, what is your thought perspective on the care and management of people with mild and moderate hemophilia right now? Well, first of all, I think anybody who has moderate hemophilia should, in my view, be offered prophylaxis as a matter of routine. Certainly in Ireland, people with moderate hemophilia are treated as severe and, and they're all offered prophylaxis. They don't all take prophylaxis, but they're all offered prophylaxis because otherwise they're actually at a significant disadvantage. We now have people with severe hemophilia who have a factor level equivalent, a constant level of 10 to 15 percent. And then you've got somebody with you know, moderate hemophilia between 2 and 5 percent. They're, they're disadvantaged, so you need to offer them prophylaxis. With mild hemophilia, there's a huge variety. I mean, you've got somebody who's got 6 percent, somebody who's got 38 percent. They both have mild hemophilia. You could actually go through perhaps a lot of your life with 30, 35, 38% and not know you have mild hemophilia. But I think um, there's a difference. I I think when you take people with severe hemophilia and you give them access to subcutaneous therapies, you give them access to gene therapy, you give them access to the next generation of subcut therapies, which will be more potent. You're going to turn a generation of severes into a generation of milds but with better coping skills. I think the big difference I've seen, certainly, Mm. is that many people with mild hemophilia don't have the coping skills. They don't recognize a bleed in time. They don't seek treatment in time. They don't get treatment in time. They they drag themselves into the center three days after this pain starts in their leg and the bleed is already well established. So I think it's also difficult to outreach to them in terms of education. We've certainly found here that they like their own meetings. We will we, we've tried to have sessions on mild hemophilia at our general meetings, but the numbers aren't large enough. And secondly, they like their own issues being dealt with So as, as a group. Mm. So we, we would tend to have smaller meetings, just people with mild or moderate hemophilia. But I certainly think that, you know, in terms of, you know, mo- moderate is the new severe, but I think mild is going to be the new severe in, in, in the sense that I, I'm from talking to some clinicians, certainly they're spending more of their time now dealing with people with mild hemophilia because they're, they're typically not on prophylaxis. They don't have the same coping skills. They don't always recognize a bleed in time. And I think we need, we need some new tools. We need the development of a handheld ultrasound, especially mm-hmm. with subcutaneous therapies on the market where you're not sure people switch to this. Is this a bleed? Is this not a bleed? If you had something right. that could quickly tell you that you could scan the joint and send a picture off to the center that confirm whether or not it's bleeding, that would be very, very useful. Certainly would, yeah. And and I like you. I've I've heard more and more clinicians speaking about mild hemophilia patients in a way that it's needed, but it also brings to mind that there's just some vulnerability there that if we don't make an effort to address, uh, won't be addressed, and we'll leave those patients vulnerable. So I appreciate the insights, Brian. I appreciate the time. Are you traveling to the WFH, or are you presenting and participating virtually? I'm, t- I'm traveling to WFH. Yes, I'm actually going over. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I plan to as well. And then I'm going to Orlando to the Coalition for Hemophilia B meeting. Of course you are. Speak about as well. <laughs> of course you are. Well, great, Brian. Thanks for the time today. And I look forward to seeing you then in person in Montreal in a matter of weeks. Okay, Patrick. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks, Patrick. And thanks, You're Brian. Love <laughs> him. I do too. Love him. It's always it's just always important to have like an Irish rogue on the podcast. You know, I don't know. Absolutely. Every other month or so. That would work for me. Too. I, hey, I mean, Patrick James Lynch over here is all in favor of having as many people from Ireland on the podcast as we <laughs> want to. And he, he, you know, not unlike Mark Skinner and Glenn Pierce, yeah. these guys with hemophilia, yes. they they were born, well, I guess Glenn doesn't have it anymore because of his liver, but, you know, born with hemophilia. Once a blood brother, always a blood brother. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but who have lived through it, but have also dedicated their professional lives yes. to making a difference, to better understanding, to asking the questions that weren't previously being asked. So, 
anytime I have the chance to speak to any one of those guys yes. at length, I always learn. I'm, I'm inspired. I'm motivated. It just it does something to me that, with all due respect to advocacy leaders, clinical and medical leaders, if they don't have the condition, it, there's just there's just something different that's operating when the person actually has the thing on top of being an expert yeah. in it. So yeah. thank you, Brian, for your time, and we will most certainly have you back on. Love it. Let's do a transition. Let's do a transition. How should we do it? I don't know. Hmm. We're just going to make it up. Uh, what, listeners, what do you think? Mailbag, blushtoomedia.com. <laughs> How should we do this transition? This is good audio. We have another segment. We have a brand new segment for y'all. As you know, we have dedicated um, airtime once a month uh, for the past year to mental health with mm-hmm. our Let's Talk segment uh, with our host, Joshua Bragg. Mm-hmm. And we have a double down. We're actually going to double down on mental health and overall wellness and have just a space every month um, for us to kind of slow down and uh, be introspective and just take time for us to really talk about the things that matter. And we're so excited that that um, our new segment, our new monthly segment, it's called The Well. The and Well. It- <laughs> the Well. And that's how we're going to introduce it every time. Oh, God. The well. But it features um, Flo. Water. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it features Flo co-host Jessica Lauren Richmond, who's one of my favorite people ever. And if you haven't listened to Flo, because I don't know, you're a dude— <laughs> she has this wonderful, like, just, I don't know, this, like, peaceful voice. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's going to be wonderful. And it's just, like, a time for you to slow down, be introspective, take time for your soul. And we think it's important. The Well. Welcome to The Well. We are standing by a wishing well. When we talk about health, physical, mental, or otherwise. There's illness, there's wellness, and then there's that spot in between. Not sick, not 100%. And then there's the nuance of chronic illness, where health does not exist on a linear spectrum, on a one line from sick to well. Instead, there may be a cyclical nature of sickness and healing, trauma and recovery. Wellness can actually be about feeling limitless while actively managing a lot of limitations. An illness can be this magical place from which to build a most effective health plan. Oh, by the way, I'm Jessica, or Jay Rich. I co-host Flow, Straight Talk About Extreme Periods. And on Flow, we discuss again and again, with new episodes the second Thursday of each month, how extreme menstrual pain can actually be what motivates action towards treatment and healing. And when I'm not hosting Flow, I'm also a human in a human body, which can be wild, you know? Recently, I had an experience with this human body of mine, which can truly only be described as very gross. And lucky for you, I'm going to go into detail about it in a second. One, it was quite painful and painfully reorienting at times. It involved breathing in infected putrid air, which made it quite difficult to feel safe breathing in. Again, this experience was so physically grounding, gross, and impactful. I was certainly unwell, yet I proceeded about my business of life, not knowing the scope of my own unwellness, or rather not paying it enough attention. And so when someone would ask me, Hey, how are you? I'd say, good, how are you? But from this vantage, now where I am able to fully breathe, I'd have to correct myself. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Well, first of all, Superman does good. You doing well. Secondly, I was not well. Not sick, but not well. I was in that in-between place physically and therefore quite distracted mentally. I was in the in-between place. (laughs) (laughs) Like so many, my unwellness required pain to truly get my attention. Big pain, and physical work. The experience I had is the sort of thing I would wish on my worst enemy. You know, the kind of thing they can live through as long as they first connect to themselves through their own suffering. To present it more appropriately as the horror story it was to experience, I'm going to ask for a little help from haunting season horror and fear expert Joshua Sterling Bragg. Hmm? Huh? Hello. (laughs) Josh, can we make this a horror story about being sick? Go on. 
<laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you just the facts, but can we make it scary? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. Go. Gray stuff. The kind of material one might fear brains would be like if one found oneself with one's brains falling out of one's own face through their mouth. Gray stuff, putrid and stench, came out of my face through my nose when I sneezed. Achoo! Bless you. Thank you. Gray stuff, debris of old skin cells and plaque from food particles stuck in my maxillary sinus for perhaps literally years fell out of my face from the back of my throat as I went to speak. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Gray stuff, the pieces of deadness that had been living in my face, accumulating the possibility of life bacterial infection, has sat inside my breathing passageway, so I learned to hold my breath. I was like an Olympian swimmer, but with less upper body strength. <sighs> hey, how are you? Good, how are My neighborhood knows me as the spitter. I carry around a tissue to spit mucus into. Whether or not folks I interact with find this strange, unfortunately gross, or what have you, I can't really be concerned with. I'm just putting on my proverbial oxygen mask. I'm literally just trying to breathe. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Are, are you sure? No. What seemed like a bad cold, a terrible cold, okay, the worst sinus infection in my life of recurring sinus infections, a breathing blockage that somehow became a big enough problem to press on my sensitive tooth nerve. This thing happening to my body was actually what I did not even know could be a thing. Friends, family, strangers, I present to you something I hope you haven't ever had to hear of before. A tonsil stone. A what? A tonsil stone is a hard, sometimes painful bit of bacteria and debris that gets stuck in the nook of your tonsils. Oh. Yeah, I told you it was gross. Do you want to see a picture? Nope, not really. My dentist, my favorite clinician, x-rayed and saw the tip of the iceberg of the issue at hand or at face. My entire left side of my face, in fact, had passageways clogged. No oxygen could break through, but here's the tricky thing. Before I could get the oxygen through my face, oxygen, the thing my body wants so very much, before I could deal with the physical ailment happening, I had to deal with something else. Hey, how are you? Good. I didn't know what was wrong with me, but more importantly, I didn't know how to say I'm not okay. Before I could deal with the problem in my sinuses, I had to deal with this other unwellness. Hey, how are you? Good. Do I think I deserve this pain? Do I think it's normal to hold my breath? What does it mean to acknowledge I'm not living my life to it the fullest? I want to because of habitual chronic self-neglect. And at what point does this become slow suicide? Oh, can he hear me? Not at all. Ha, phew. Why am I so good at disassociating? <laughs> huh. So, how are you? You know, I really don't know. I might be dying. How are you? Yeah. The thing about thinking about dying, death, health, living, is that it's really all the same thing to consider. Physical and mental health, the same, 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 connected. And realizing this, like flipping a magical switch, I was healed. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I did start learning language to talk about my health and what was keeping me sick, which wasn't just the gray stuff in my face. Hey, how are you? Well, the gray stuff is gone now, but it left with me the terror memory of understanding my physical body in a new way, something I'm rather keen on talking about. Well, that's great news. <laughs> Indeed, because Josh's Let's Talk, a segment you know and love right here on Bloodstream, focuses on mental health. And this season, he's invited me to join the conversation and help lead the way to a place a little deeper into the woods right here by this actual wishing well that we are standing right next to. We are standing by a wishing well. Right. So now when we let's talk, we'll talk and then we'll go a little bit deeper into the conversation at the well. At a well which stands deep in a thick wood 
at a clearing where small creatures bask in pillars of sunlight cast from open-armed branches of the trees above. We should wrap this up. But wherever we are, uh, we're going to converse on mental wellness and discuss how overall mental health is impacted by physical health, specifically when living and managing rare bleeding disorders. When thinking about illness and wellness, about life and potentially life-threatening emergency room visits, it helps to be comfortable talking about all the feelings that come up when thinking about death. Where do we begin? Well, when you read, you begin with... When we talk about wellness, we begin with D-E-A-T-H-E, where it all starts, the end. Right, yes, of course, Hmm. except that uh, life begins with birth. I will give you that beginnings and endings are equally important, like any story. Well, true, what's the Titanic without it sinking at the end? Exactly, rhetoric! Well, whichever way we start it. We'll talk about dying differently. We'll talk loss, changing and evolving. Growing versus aging. (laughs) How to suffer. (laughs) And how to be in the moment Mm. without the past or the future. What are those anyway? I don't know, but we will also talk about acknowledge and relating to the past, maybe your past, and relating to both abstract concepts like time and relating to people, you know, relationships. And coping with discoveries. And in the end, where it all starts for some, we'll talk birth. So we'll talk birth at the end? We'll start at the end or we'll end at the start. All right, don't get smart. Too late! (laughs) Well, let's dive in on the next episode. Indeed. Till then, be well. You as well. And welcome back from the well. (laughs) And thank you to Jessica and Josh for that first installment of what will now be a reoccurring part of the Bloodstream podcast. On our first episode each month, you will hear the well. The second episode each month will feature Josh in his traditional Let's Talk spot. So both episodes each month, as Amy was saying earlier, will now have um, a spot that's about our holistic health, our mental health, and health beyond simply bleeding disorders. So thank you, Jessica, for helping kick off the well. Amy, was there anything in particular from that that resonated with you or you wanted to respond to? I just think it's lovely to have a bit of time to normalize some of these things. And I think that's what both Let's Talk and The Well really does well. (laughs) Hey, this is the new flow where we just can't help using it in sentences. Yes, and we have, you know, Josh and um, Jessica J. Rich um, in particular are just lovely guides to just normalize some of the things that I think we all experience, even if you don't experience the same thing. I just think it's so helpful to like have that recognition and to normalize um, those feelings that we have, those fears that we have. So I just really appreciate their work and hope you do too, dear listener. I I like the point she made pretty early on about when when living with uh, feeling limitless mm. while living with managing such limitations. Yes. And you know, like the point she was making about there's this we're not either well or sick, right? Like most of life is existing somewhere not on those polar ends, but yeah. somewhere in, in the middle of the spectrum. Um, I know that's something as a person with hemophilia, I have wrestled with my whole life is acknowledging that I do have real limitations, but wanting to feel as limitless as possible and then having to reconcile, well, what does that actually mean then about how I do live my life? Because I do have these things that limit me and I need to manage, but I also don't want to feel unnecessarily limited um, or as though I don't have opportunities that, you know, a normie out there does. So like you said, Things like this segment help normalize these thoughts, these feelings. So thank you, Jess. Thank you, Josh, for providing these kinds of things to us. Let's next get to our final segment for today's episode. It is Amy's interview all about Twitter. We tried to get a LinkedIn expert. We, we tried so, so hard. No one does Amy's LinkedIn. <laughs> no one platform. does research on LinkedIn. But there was a published article about the use of Twitter and about hemophilia. Twitter. And Dr. Ben Samuelson-Jones was one of the authors on that article. So a we doctor. said, well, we got to have you over here, Dr. Twitter. Talk to Amy about <laughs> Twitter doctor work. And that's what happens. And you're going to hear that interview right now. I am here with Dr. Benjamin Samuelson-Jones. He wrote a paper called Digital Hemophilia, Insights into the Use of Social Media for Hemophilia Care, Research, and Advocacy. We are so excited to get into this work. 
Welcome to the podcast, Ben. Thanks so much. Tell us a little bit about your connection to the bleeding disorder community as we get started. Yeah, so I'm a pediatric hematologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and my clinical practice uh, includes seeing lots of boys and young adults with bleeding disorders. And my academic interest is really in developing new therapies for people with bleeding disorders, and then also how best to implement new technologies and therapies into clinical practice and and advocacy. So you co-wrote this paper that I mentioned. Can you give listeners a brief overview of your research and your findings? Yeah, thanks. So what we, what we, and this was really, I should give credit where credit is due. Robert Chen, who's an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, and who's worked with me on a number of sort of basic science projects looking at factor eight biochemistry and the immune response to factor eight is really interested in big data and was taking a course on how to think about analyzing big data. And he read a number of, of papers looking at social media use in other disease communities and then came to me and was like, you know what? I know you're start, you, you've gotten interested in using Twitter a little bit, and I think we could do this what, similar to what these other researchers did, but looking at how hemophilia is used on Twitter. And I was a little, you know, it was, it was new to me. And I said, okay, if you want to go ahead and do this on your, as your side, side, side project, that's fine with me. And I'm happy to sort of think about what the results might mean. So we'll get to the results. So, you know, so what we did was he pulled two years worth of all the tweets that mentioned hemophilia spelled either the British or the American way over a two-year period. And that was about 57,000 tweets. And then where we, what we had to do was try to understand, analyze this big data set and to try to come up with some meaningful insights into it. And what we did is, is we used natural language processing to sort of pull out common phrases and terms and categorize all these tweets into some themes. So, and the, But the first thing we did actually... And this was one of the really surprising things is within those 57,000, about 10% were duplicates and tweets that mentioned a stock ticker. So we, we, <laughs> we, deleted, we deleted those or removed those. And then what we found, and this was really interesting, was, was that was, we've identified about 47,000 that discussed hemophilia in a medical context. And that was really what we thought we were going to find. But then we found about 4,000 other tweets that mention hemophilia in non-medical context. And those are used by sort of the general public, and and I can sort of talk a little bit more about what context that's used in. So within these medical tweets, which was the bulk of what we were looking at, Mm -hmm. we identified about 11 themes that all the tweets, we we could categorize about half the, the, the tweets into, and that includes things like gene therapy was the largest theme, but then blood contamination, uh, World Hemophilia Day, research, medical management, COVID came up a few times, hemophilia okay. symptoms, treatment cost, inhibitors, athletics, and like mental health. And then the other thing we looked at was how the users with the most engagement, both wh- what they were doing and what type of users they were. So we looked at the top 250 users by engagement. And then we categorize them into 11 categories. And so the, the most common category was support organizations. <laughs> um, but then we also, you know, we also found a number of individuals, you know, many people with bleeding disorders were tweeting about hemophilia, physicians, researchers, and the list goes down. We found about 11 categories. And we were able to sort of 85% of all the, the high frequency tweeters we were able to identify to group into one of these categories. So that's what we did. That's fantastic. And, and what did you conclude? Yeah, so, so we found a couple of conclusions. You know, this was really, we, we didn't have a, a, a hypothesis going in, mm-hmm. but we, we identified a number of things I think are interesting. So one, one lesson we learned was, even though support and advocacy groups are the most common high type of user that tweets a lot, mm-hmm. the individuals get much, much more engagement. And the individuals that do are people with bleeding disorders and uh, non-physicians. And there's one more, and researchers and, 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 and researchers. And to me, what that sort of highlights is the role 
that the individuals have an advocacy on social media. Yeah. And also, even though there's lots of algorithms and, you know, bots running, what, what people really connect with are the personal stories. Huh. And so I think that was sort of interesting as we think about how we need to advocate on social media. And mm-hmm. it's obviously, support and advocacy groups are really important. But I think individuals can really propel the conversation. That's so interesting. And Twitter, I think Twitter is an interesting choice. Why did you narrow in on Twitter? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And certainly Twitter is not the most popular worldwide social media mm-hmm. platform, but it really, because of these short tweets mm-hmm. and your ability to extract the entire what is posted, it really is much more accessible to this type of analysis. Oh, it's so interesting. You know, I've, I always think of Twitter as like kind of a reactionary social platform. It's kind of the conversation, you know, just uh, you can kind of get a sense of what the conversation is. But clinical research in particular, I think, is a slower pace, meticulous conversation. So what is the balance that you kind of aim for to strike when it comes to communicating about clinical research on Twitter? Or like, what did you find? The research categories sort of spanned a lot of things from mm-hmm. people posting, researchers posting new publications to job, you know, announcing positions or hiring positions or, or new results you know, papers or meeting abstracts was sort of what we saw in the research category. Interesting. I did, I'm not sure I fully answered your question. No, no, no. I, I, I think, I guess maybe a, a more clear question would be, is research being discussed on Twitter? And I know it is a, a little bit. I follow some of it. And is it, what are the effective trends of talking about, you know, up-to-date clinical research happening on Twitter? Yeah, so, so, so I, I think, we didn't have any metric to say if this was good communication or, or, or for research specifically, actually. But that's a great thought and certainly something you could sort of do on the back end. You know, what we did see within the management group, which is, you know, more, more so how people are using different factor products, it included some of the adverse events with Hemolibra or emicizumab or how p- people were, sp- were using specific products. You know, one thing we identified was an issue, you know, the issue of not every person with a bleeding disorder is the same. And sometimes mm-hmm. when medical advice gets posted on social media, it's not always applicable to everyone. Um, and so we found a number of, of instances of that. Fortunately, at frank misinformation uh, about hemophilia was really rare. Mm. We looked at uh, the thou- manually the, the the thousand the tweets with the, the the top thousand tweets with the most engagement, and we only found seven tweets that were really that we identified manually with misinformation. So zero point five percent, which we thought was was really good um, as, as sort of frank misinformation. That's interesting. And so those tweets that were most engaged with, did they come from individuals rather than like organizations? Yeah, so 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 there. there I mean, there, there's a mix. The, yeah. the the misinformation tweets. You know, we we have the user information, but we didn't include it explicitly, which we thought was for a reasonable approach for for privacy. Interesting. I kind of think like this is a, a paper that our our organizations should maybe consider um, in terms of their engagement and trying to activate patients with personal stories, since that seems to be generating the most engagement. Yeah, I hope, you know, as, as organizations think about, you know, the goals they want to advocate for, I think it's really important to act, like, just like you said, act, you know, I hope this paper, you know, I think the big conclusion is that they need, people need to activate individuals. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and grassroots um, approaches are probably going to be, at least, you know, if, if your outcome is Twitter engagement, individuals are more important. You know, we, I, I, we're not able to save you know, you're trying to enact real, real world, unquote, change. You know, we had no metric for that. That's so interesting. Is there any other research or published work that you're working on that you'd like to make our listeners aware of? Or are you just focused on Twitter these days? Yeah, no, <laughs> just get jig. Yeah, no. You know, this was really a, this was a side project for Robert Chen. And it was a side project for me, but but you know, I I'm I'm a late adopter to Twitter. I just jo- I actually joined within the time frame that you know we pulled these tweets from. And I joined sort of just before the COVID pandemic, but I've, it's been really neat to see how fast information can be passed along. 
you know, especially when the most important medical questions of their time are being, you know, changing rapidly. Yeah. And it's always fun to be able to combine your your hobby with your, you know, with an academic output. You know, and so my, my, my other research interests are really gene therapy for hemophilia and the biochemistry of factor eight and factor nine, and, and especially how the, the gain of function factor nine variant, factor nine Padua, which is really used in gene therapy for most hemophilia B gene therapy products, what makes it gain of function. And so we've had a number of publications over the last couple of years uh, deciphering that biochemical mechanism. But I think that's a little, that may be a little technical. No way. We love that stuff. We love it. <laughs> we love it. We might we might nerd out on the Twitter stuff, but we'll nerd out even more on the gene therapy stuff. So that's yeah, great. Yeah. We're going to well, follow. I think, I think that's probably more important, in, you know, in the, in the long run. I, ho- I hope so. I hope. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your findings. It was great. You, it, We're so excited to be introduced to you and your work, and we hope to have you on the podcast again. Is there any way for folks to keep up with you? What's your Twitter handle? What, what, where can folks uh, kind of follow you and your research? Yeah, that's great. Um, I can be found at Dr. Samuelson Jones, S-A-M-E-L-S-O-N-J-O-N-E-S. Yes, that's perfect. Listeners, we're going to have that in our program notes, so please give him a follow. And thank you so much, Ben. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to Dr. Ben Samuelson, Twitter Jones, for being our guest today on the Bloodstream Podcast. Thanks as well to Brian O'Mahani for coming on to talk gene therapy, the Irish community, and so much more. Jessica, Josh, thank you for your work on The Well. And thank you, Amy Board, Mm -hmm. for being you. Well, it's not easy, but someone has to do it. You know what I'm saying? Amy, what can listeners expect next time on Bloodstream? It's humongous. Like wow. Our next batch of episodes is all about HFA, and it's going to rule. So some highlights yes. from our April 23rd uh, live from HFA episode. We're going to be live from HFA, which is going to be a hoot and a holler. That sounds fancy. We've got keynote interviews. So um, several of the folks that are doing the keynotes, we're going to have interviews with them mm-hmm. to kind of— um, one of these guys, by the way, his name is Xander Masser. Yeah, yeah. He's got this thing. It's called I'm Burying My Father, the series. And this is the quick, you're going to hear so much more about this soon, so I won't go too far. But he has severe hemophilia B, or his, um, his dad lived with severe hemophilia B, contracted HIV, and unfortunately passed away in 2000. Xander was 14 when his dad passed away, but in his 30s, uncovered 10,000 slides from his dad. His name is Randy. His dad, Randy's career as a professional photographer, which prompted him to, you know, dig deeper into his dad's life. And now that's blossomed into this exhibit, this whole project that he's done, Unburying My Father. Xander's one of the keynote speakers. The Unburying My Father exhibit is one of the centerpieces of Symposium. And Xander is going to be one of the guests that Amy's referring to. We're going to interview and have on our April 23rd live from HFA. HFA episode. It's going to be so great. So, so great. We'll be back actually next week with a little teaser about what we've got coming with HFA, but we're, we're going to talk to a bunch of people there. We've got a podcast room. We do. Um, so we're going to Got gonna an eight-person panel. Yeah. We've yeah, got all kinds of we've shenanigans. We've got the crew coming. Like, we have crew, like, Believe There's Limited team. crew coming. Yeah. So anyway, it's going to be great. So the next couple of episodes are going to feature um, content from HFA. So those of you that are going to the meeting, this will be fun. This will be, um, you know, kind of an extension of what you're, you're seeing. And those of you that are not coming to HFA, what a great opportunity for you guys to kind of listen in and get an idea of what of what went on. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be thinking about you guys in particular, those who yeah. can't be there but are interested. So yeah. we're going to be trying to capture some of like the sounds and the moments and we're kind of do a little bit of reporting on what we're witnessing just to help you feel more connected to the conference. This is the first in-person meeting like this that we have had in yeah. years. Yeah. But of course, not everybody who wants to be there can be there. So we've got you covered. And if there's anything you want to make sure to hear about, let us know about it, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. If you're going to be there and would like to try to set aside some time to chat with either Amy or I for the podcast, let us know, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or get in touch with one of us on social. And really, since I'm already starting to do all of this like outro stuff, Amy, I may as well just say that with that, that is all for this episode. Do it. With that, that is all for this episode. (laughs) 
the well. Reminder to subscribe to the Bloodstream Podcast wherever you listen. Share this episode with family, friends, colleagues, your male persons, a gardener, anyone. Just share this so far and wide. And subscribe if you haven't already. You are a listener. Mm. We need you to become a subscriber. And if you are a subscriber, we love you we for that. We love you for that. You are the big winner. Also, if you're a subscriber and if you have a bleeding disorder or a healthcare topic you'd like to hear us discuss, we'd love to hear from you. We really would. Honestly, if you'd like to inquire about storytelling or casting opportunities for Bloodstream Media's podcast or Believe Limited's films, please email us. We actually have several things coming up. We would love for you uh, to tell your story with us. Please email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. Or you can connect with Bloodstream Media on social media. You'll find us all. Everybody. <laughs> Bloodstream Media, Patrick, myself, Keith, everybody, everybody. on Facebook, Instagram, Mostly Twitter. Keith. We're also on LinkedIn because that's what you do with business. And we're on LinkedIn. <laughs> I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. I am your other host, Amy Bourne. And until next time, take self-care of yourself and bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.